Okay, my turns aren't awful. They're just not that good. <laughs> The White River Canyon is really popular with sledders, inner tubers, and all manner of other inexperienced suburbanites coming up to spend their one day a year playing in the snow, and for that reason, it is frequently ignored by backcountry skiers and splitboarders who figure it's just a flat wasteland that isn't worth the time and effort. Now let's find out if that's actually an accurate opinion. But before we talk about that, I do need you to like, subscribe, and navigate to patreon.com slash voiceovertrails if you're finding content like this helpful or at the very least. Interesting. It's totally understandable for experienced snow sports enthusiasts to be dismissive if not downright snobbish toward White River Canyon. It's mostly flat near the bottom. It's got a huge parking lot that fills to overflowing on snowy weekends from December through the end of February only. Not enough bathrooms, lots of families with lots of little kids, and not a snow tire or traction device to be seen in the entire parking lot. For a backcountry skier, what's not to hate. Now, full disclosure, I've been up this way before, but the first time I tried to ski here, I skied in with my cross-country skis while carrying my alpine skis on my back and then switched when I got as high as I could safely get. That wasn't a very good idea. If you've ever tried to put alpine boots on in the snow when, it's, when the boots are cold, it, it was nearly impossible. But that was almost 20 years ago. And on this day, New Year's Day, some friends wanted to poke around up here, so I opted to join them and find out what's in here beyond the matting crowds. Speaking of cross-country skiing, don't do that here. There are a lot of inexperienced snowshoers as well as people just post-holing around. You know, post-holing is when you try to walk in deep snow with just shoes on and you leave a bunch of what look like post holes behind you. Doesn't look very fun. Anyway, so there's usually nothing resembling the nice looking track that you see in this video. This, this is unusual. This is something that we created long before the crowds got here. Anyhow, it's nice and scenic up here, and regardless of whether or not the skiing was any good, we were already having a good time just poking around, so the day was generally off to a good start. Even though it's relatively flat, this canyon still contains hazards, and the most obvious hazard in here is that eventually, if you want to get higher up, you'll have to cross the White River, and the only way to do that is over a snow bridge. There is never a guarantee that one of these snow bridges won't collapse, and the one we were utilizing felt less stable than I was comfortable with. I definitely wouldn't want to try to cross one of these without skis on to distribute my weight. Your mileage may vary, but just keep that in mind. If you get wet up here and can't get back to the car in time to warm up, you're dead. Still, I like how the landscape is so open up here. This is actually one of my favorite places to hang out in the summer when there's no one up here. It's an awesome place to go backpacking in the summer. You should just try it sometime. If you keep climbing up this relatively flat canyon, you'll eventually encounter steepness. We had to actually start cutting switchbacks and using our risers about two miles from the parking lot. By this point, the crowds of less experienced folks at the bottom are just a fading memory. And since it's not possible to see either of the large ski resorts from here, at least not yet, there is a calming and relaxing sense of solitude. So what we set out to do was climb to the top of the butte or mesa or plateau, whatever you want to call it, that separates the west rim from the east rim of the canyon. The initial steep pitch up to this relatively flat area is just a preview of the real climb up ahead. If you find yourself up here, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about with this approach up to the top of the mesa. To a skier or split border, the ideal destination is pretty obvious. But the approach up the spine of this ridge is intensely steep. It's almost steep enough to require ski crampons, and on a firmer, icier day would definitely require ski crampons. But I wouldn't recommend this on an icy day anyhow. I mean, that just seems like a recipe for misery. Closer to the top, it becomes impossible to climb this without cutting in some switchbacks. Just remember that really strong climbers always wake up before you do. So it is a guarantee that if you're following their track, it'll be steeper than you prefer. But I do want to point out that this becomes advanced terrain up here. Don't forget that. I'm going to repeat this later, but even though the canyon is gentle at the beginning, all this cool stuff up here is too advanced for beginner to intermediate skiers. But it sure is cool looking up here as it becomes a knife edge. I'm not even sure if it would be reasonably possible to get up here in the summer with all the loose ash this whole area is made out of, so winter on backcountry skis might be the only way you'll ever find yourself up here. One of the nice things about the terrain here is that there are east and west facing aspects that are both skiable depending on which which way the wind has been blowing and depositing snow. We decided 
This looked like as good a place as any to skin up and bag a short descent, so we took advantage. It's possible to see Timberline Lodge from here, and the explosions from avalanche control over at Mount Hood Meadows were clearly audible as well. I'm going to say it again. This is advanced terrain. The snow conditions were variable and changed dramatically from the top to the middle section of this slope. It's also steep with no easy way out. Everything up here is steep with no easy way out. In short, it's advanced terrain, but it was also a lot of fun. The day we rode, New Year's Day, was one of those weird days where the snow got colder and icier as we got to the bottom of the canyon. And here's the cool thing about this little side of the canyon and this descent. There's a lot of varied terrain in here, and that variation translates into options. And those options translate into more skiing opportunities. So we put our skins back on at the bottom of the slope and continued up the drainage. Backcountry skis are weird, man. It's such a great way of getting around on the snow that it's almost hard to really comprehend what it is that you're doing when you're doing it. It's almost surreal, and it has to be experienced to be believed. And experience it, we did. As the fog started rolling in and the snow turned to windblown crust as we proceeded up one of the slopes on the east side of the canyon. It's hard to predict how the wind is going to move snow around up here, so it's important to be prepared for exposed rocks and even undersoil, as sometimes coverage is less complete than you might hope for. And as quickly as the fog rolled in, it rolled back out as we summited this bluff. Actually, the fog didn't so much clear as we just climbed above it. And this is the next place we peeled off our skins and went for a nice descent. This second descent was even more complex and technical than the first one. It was just as steep, but this time with crunchier and less predictable snow with thinner coverage and flat light. I'm just going to go ahead and mention again that this is not a good place for beginner or intermediate skiers. The terrain goes from boring to advanced with nothing in between very quickly, which again is what's fun about it but you just need to know if you're still kind of like if you're uncomfortable with uncertainty you're going to have a very bad time i tend to be cautious and i brought that caution with me on the descent because there's never a good time for an injury weight distribution was definitely a challenge on this descent the snow was unpredictable so strategy had to change a lot and quickly that's another sign of needing advanced skills you have to be able to adjust your approach to skiing the slope in a split second that's likely to always be the case up in here as the snow is not groomed and the variable terrain coupled with the intense weather leads to unpredictability throughout this canyon but here's the cool part another cool part anyway we were fully expecting that we would need to put our skins back on to make it back to the bottom of the canyon because we figured as we descended through this glade that we'd run out of a momentum and be unable to overtop this little hump separating us from the White River. But we lucked out and we were able to pole push our way up the last few feet of that hump and overtop it. Man, I love little winds like this. And again, it's that advanced ability. You need to be able to keep your momentum up and like aim, fire, ski very well in a way that allows you to keep your momentum up in order to really enjoy yourself up in here. And from the top of that hump down to the White River, there was yet another bonus glade descent. We got three descents for the price of two. I was genuinely very happy at the bottom of this. After we crossed back over the snow bridge, there was just a little bit of herring boning to get back up the drainage, but still not enough that we needed to put our skins back on. I was also expecting to need to put skins back on to get back out, but just like the first time I came up here on the cross-country skis, it's just barely steep enough that poles are just enough to keep your momentum going. The only thing you have to watch out for is irresponsible dog owners allowing their dogs to run off leash, like this one that I almost ran into. Foolish dog owners aside, be respectful as you're exiting this canyon and watch out for people, as there are a lot of less experienced users up here later in the morning and early afternoon. I think just lots of parents and toddlers everywhere. As I got near the bottom of this canyon, it was downright crowded. In this situation, it is not the responsibility of the sledders to watch out for us. They're inexperienced and most seemed pretty surprised to see us on skis. Keep that in mind and ski in a way that you can avoid collisions. Don't expect the folks showing up in jeans and cotton sweatshirts to know the finer points of snow sports etiquette. Just get out of their way. But overall, this was a lot of fun. We ended up netting about 1,600 feet of climbing, so if I was going to do this again, 
I would add the very obvious east facing slope that appears to climbers left about one mile into the canyon to add another fun descent and even things out to a nice 2000 foot day just for good measure. I can emphatically and without reservation, recommend the White River Canyon to advanced backcountry skiers who want to poke around and play on some mixed terrain. I'd like to take this moment to thank all my Patreon supporters, especially my Lomi Goodness level sponsors Andy Suri, Brad Goodson, and Charles Kim. I'd also like to thank my Hero Dirt level sponsors, earning their special mention at the end of this video, Brian Fix, Bryce Ulrich, Devin Young, Edward Lanton, and Pedro Cantorini. If you'd like to see your name on this scrolling list of distinguished supporters who believe in objective, focused, and informational outdoors-related content, navigate to patreon.com slash voiceovertrails and sign up for a sponsorship level that feels right to you. There is a link in the description. Now, get out there and go shred some POW.